thank you all very much, and thank you guys for all hanging in there for the day. I think it was a fantastic one. I'm going to keep my comments rather brief and um, sort of similar to um, the previous uh, moderator um, deliver a little bit of a, an overall set of comments and then a few questions for each of um, the speakers, although I'm going to go about it just uh, slightly differently in that uh, the kind of meat of the questions will be in this first part and then just a couple of sort of scattered questions for each of you um, because I see some real through lines that I feel like I can sort of throw um, to all of you. Um, before I do that, I want to thank um, the Sackler Center, um, Eleanor Whitney, Sarah Giovanello, Lauren Ross, Catherine Morris, and of course Elizabeth Sackler um, for making uh, these kinds of events possible. Um, before I get into my, my, as I say, my notes here, I wanted to start with something that, um, that Zeta sort of ended with, which is um, I, I'm extremely, um, I find it extremely important to always moor our conversations in kind of historical context. And so when we look at an image from the 1970s and then one that looks similar um, that was made in 2008 to remember that they may have formal affinities and similar content, but of course their operations are very different. So many of my um, remarks um, will be kind of in line with that. And that said, this story of uh, Thomas looking up um, at, right after uh, President Obama is elected and finding such overtly racist images is such an interesting and, and horrific truth in the same way that I recently looked up, I was doing some work on um, utopian feminism or feminist utopia, and the first thing that comes up is this um, neoconservative blog about uh, how women are trying to ruin the world. So it's not like a fantastic, um, the first link, the most clicked on link, isn't actually about feminist utopia as a kind of progressive or even potential um, thing, but instead is a kind of reactionary um, slant on it. So I, I think that this is important, especially as we've entered new kind of political terrain and have a new sort of optimism in the air that we're also entering into deeply conservative territory, um, and we have to think about that, I think. That said, I thought it was interesting that this um, panel of papers seemed to take as its perhaps unspoken um, red thread anxiety around representation, um, or perhaps better said, a, a new anxiety about the very modes of critique that once worked that were usually understood as deconstructive, say, in the 1970s and around which there were kind of um, hopeful rhetorics. It was interesting how often words like fragmented, dispersed, abject, um, negative um, came up. There is a sort of fear, I think, underlining some of um, the, the topics that came up today. And I think it's interesting in that um, it it points, I think, to a certain set of questions about what critical practices look like and how feminism um, can be thought. In point of fact, for me, it was interesting to think about just how feminism operated in these four papers in, in that in some cases there were artists um, or cultural producers as case studies being taken as feminist. In other cases, it was the mode of address or the mode of, um, of theory that was being placed upon them that seemed to be um, being argued as feminist. It seems that this rise in a kind of plumbing of the negative, however, the debased, the invisible, um, and not necessarily in a dialectical sense, um, is holding out new promise, or at least a new kind of question about representation for everyone on the panel. But I do have to say that I wonder if there is a kind of privileging, or at least an interest in seeing through the ramifications of following through the, to the end a logic of kind of nihilism, um, again, I'm going to move quickly. I'm not trying to say that the folks on this panel have no hope, but rather that they are tending towards objects that do have a, a real weight to them in a particular way and not necessarily um, a, a clear way out of the questions that are proposed, which I find sort of interesting. Also, as I said before, if this is a kind of negativity, it may not be a, a sort of negativity in the sense of a dialectic um, a dialectical turn, so it's not so clear what the opposition um, is that's being proposed. These aren't necessarily propositions of alternative or oppositional structures that we may be used to from um, feminist theory from the 70s who were, for instance, um, proposing different ways of, uh, somebody earlier said, well, I think it was uh, actually um, 
Ms. Sackler herself, who said, until we won't stop fighting until the, the matriarchy has taken over, so perhaps this is what I'm getting at. Um, the practices that were chosen today, I think, bring up questions with regard to representational and other strategies, and I just want to think about this in terms of all the papers. The distinction between reflection, um, operations and artistic practices that reflect what's going on in, in culture and reflexive modes. Um, I think everyone on this panel was interested in thinking about that distinction. Is it a mirror held up to society, so you just merely see those operations sort of magnified, or is there a critical um, analysis being put forward? Um, I think the last few papers made that extremely clear um, with relation to, um, to Thomas, for instance, uh, this kind of question about how things are received um, if there can be a kind of pedagogy that allows for a feminist reception of works that might be more ambivalent in their, uh, in their very being. So how the word feminism operates within the case study is presented less in some ways as a weapon or even as something to be taken as content, but rather as a site of ambivalence, um, I think is something I'd like us to discuss. Uh, the implication of which seems less secure than ever, even though we use the word uh, often enough. The implication of this, uh, as I say, makes me feel as though there's a kind of productive awkwardness around feminism at the moment, which nonetheless, of course, also worries me. It seems to be both its promise and its um, uh, kind of weak uh, point. There's a subtext that reveals that even when a text is invested in feminism, it's unclear just how that investment works, what it's meant to do. If the culture, um, as many of us have just been discussing, would largely claim feminism as being over, as having made its mark, done its political duty, um, how do we use the word? And I would just say that in those kinds of overdetermined statements, it's made all the more clear that feminism is actually something that makes people continuously uncomfortable. And I know that the word post has been brought up several times today. I just want to point out that post does not mean uh, over uh, so much as it means that there's a kind of unclear um, line drawn in the sand between what would be a certain kind of mode, say with postmodernism and what comes afterwards. It's arguable whether uh, it's actually a breach or a break or whether it's a certain kind of extension that takes those terms forward. Um, post-colonial certainly doesn't work in the same way that post-feminism does. And uh, just another kind of interesting fact about the post, um, in the concise Oxford Dictionary, post-feminism appears, I think, um, very pointedly, but post-colonialism does not, um, which is something to think about, I think. Um, what is also extremely interesting about the four papers um, shared terrain, I think, is that this acknowledgement um, through turns to overly conflicted terrains of representation instead of superficially celebratory ones is that a feminist um, or a feminism riven with antinomies, which is to say conflicting claims, might be more true to histories of feminism and gives an active picture of an ever-evolving discussion for us today whose terms will never be stable and allows this to be a live conversation, one with a history, a present, and a future. I think it's interesting that um, you know, Marxist theorists are allowed not to get along, but feminists are supposed to. <laughs> Um, so I actually think this kind of antinomy with, at the heart um, of discussions of feminism is a productive and, and positive thing. Like any and all complicated political and ideological praxis, feminism should be allowed to be fragmented, riven, and unstable. In other words, theoretical. It's interesting that given the long-standing debates in feminism, for some there is an unspoken and unrealistic expectation for resolution or agreement understood as an integral aspect of discursive work in philosophy, um, say, in feminism, such constitutive unrest is sometimes characterized as lack. Um, so I'm back to this lack question. Which is at the heart of a number of these papers. I want to remind you that the reason that painting, which has been proclaimed dead so many times, stays so alive is, at least according to someone like Yves Alain Bois, that mourning allows for something that was in the past to continue forward with a history and with new conditions. I also want to say that we've been bandying about the word feminism. Um, again, in a kind of unmoored way, which I find interesting, I myself often like to use Mary Kelly, who's come up so many times today already, um, with her very precise um, phrase that 
she likes to think about art um, and theory that is informed by feminism. Theory that is informed by feminism, but also at a loss, or perhaps acknowledging itself as a kind of loss. Those are my words, not Kelly's, but um, in a recent conversation with her, we talked about the driving force of contemporary feminism being predicated on the fantasy of feminism, this so sort of um, way in which we consider our own um, links to feminism through a kind of identificatory process that's always somewhat um, not really there. This utopian idea of a we, which I think is invoked even um, in a panel like this one, but also forcefully denied in so many ways, and my question might be for some of these panelists, what happens with this desire that speaks itself as already thwarted? A notion of feminism as activism, coalition, collective building, um, that in many ways we talk about but we're not sure what to do with um, in point of fact because so many of the, at least second wave, feminism was so clearly connected um, to the politics of the moment and we have a sort of question around how our politics um, and our feminism come together, although it seems obvious in so many ways. Dispatched, um, I think, in the case studies by all of the panelists um, was this question of what feminism does, whether the kind of questions of coalition building and, and collectives can be thought about, but it was particularly interesting to me that those kind of links are made more visible in conversations around queer and transgender debates, um, which is something that uh, we may talk about later. And interestingly, though, I think there was a kind of expansive notion around heterosexuality on the panel, it, it kind of persisted as um, a paradigm uh, that gets disrupted but still maintains itself. Um, in this way, I would point back to somebody like Ariga Ray who talks about feminism as jamming the machine and women having no place of their own. Um, Anna pointed to this question about place for, uh, or space for the woman. She says that in point of fact, what's interesting about, um, about theoretical discourse um, and its writing, where it is written, uh, is that women are reduced to space in which a man takes up physical and psychical occupation. And I wondered, particularly with your paper, how you might think about the preoccupation with the man even in his displacement. Um, there is, I think, a reluctance, not on this panel necessarily, but just in general, to speculate on what feminist representation would look like because of a weariness to of a return to essentialism, but I still think it would be interesting to consider this possibility in the way that someone like Diana Fuss talks about motivated essentialism, or Jacqueline Rose describes sexuality as a disturbance in the field of vision, so not a representation per se, but instead a disabling of its smooth operations, and I think many of you pointed to this sort of operation yourselves today. So what is recognized as feminism may not always operate as such, or at least it may not look like feminism, and that new ways of reimagining the context and purview are always necessary. So in this way, of course, we usher in what could unfortunately be a total untangling of feminism, and it's impossible in that way um, to give it a kind of identity of its own. So I worry about going too far down that track and attributing a total lack of definition, a relativism um, to how we think about feminism. On the other hand, if feminism is speculative, urgent dialogue in which class, race, education, um, and other kinds of um, ideas are brought in, we have to allow it to have a certain porosity. And finally, before I give you a couple of questions, um, yourselves, I just want to think about how desire as complicated, ambivalent, and potentially critical may be something to think about as well, even in terms of um, papers that have uh, the look or at least the feel of taking on um, what would seem to be lots of ideas of lack and loss. Again, this new conservatism in which I think we reside requires how we rethink the enactment of power, how it's produced, what it looks like, what Gramsci called a production of consent in certain kinds of work. Um, and to get to something that I think Zeta was uh, hinting at here, how pedagogy is such an important part of, of feminism. It's a handing off of ideas um, and a questioning if, of if we want a feminist canon or if feminism is the disrupting of the logic of canons altogether. To this um, end, I'm gonna just turn quickly to Claire Grace, whose 
um, very succinct and interesting paper took up questions of visibility and empowerment, I think, very well. She points to Peggy Phelan's um, distinction between the marked and unmarked, and I think very nicely problematizes um, either having ultimate potency and that both have their dangers. Um, in, in this way, I thought, too, of Hart Sadia Hartman's refusal of visibility in her um, scenes of subjection, uh, which, of course, I'm also thinking about Zeta here as well. But what is the politics um, of invisibility? This is a, just a kind of question. How do we think, and I think you began to ask this question, um, if we understand it as reiterating a kind of invisibility that's already there, how do we um, give it a kind of visibility uh, counterintuitively? You pointed out that, interestingly, we live in a moment where myths of mastery, uh, at least visual mastery, are at an extremely high level, even if for many of us, deconstructive practices would seem to have done away um, with all of this. And so I'm, quest I'm wondering if the fragmented, never complete view that, mimicking, that mimics surveillance uh, taken up by Ackerman, does it reveal these operations or simply reflect them? Um, again, something that you started to talk about. And an important element that you mentioned, Claire, how does this affect, how does this affect art spectatorial operations differently um, or how do they actually operate within the gallery differently than they might um, in another context? In addition, how might we think about Ackerman's insistence on her own place within this um, kind of field um, via unstable narrative? If you posit, as you do, that fiction itself can take on a kind of subversive um, operation, um, could you talk about how invisible protagonists as uh, filmmakers or art makers um, as a kind of feminist refusal, the gaze with no point of view, no comprehensibility, can still put forward a kind of um, ta tacit political thematization. Um, I'm also, uh, in terms of Patricia's um, paper, happy to see a complication of the pleasure and repression paradigm, um, one that we've, of course, thought about over the years a lot, but of course, insisting on explicit representation um, historically must be um, made, I think, uh, very complicated in terms of how it operated before and how it operates now. Indeed, even the assumption that all women share the common trait of a certain type of genitalia should be questioned, I think. Um, masturbation also is characterized as a very heteronormative um, thing, at least as it is put forward here, one in which uh, pleasure-seeking and, and expansive production is put against a kind of ungenerous one that is, um, uh, in terms of a kind of biological paradigm, conservative and heterosexual. Um, some have argued similarly in regard to homosexual sex. There's a kind of ungenerosity. I wanted to point to the Bad Girls exhibition from the early, mid-1990s um, in terms of Emin, just to ask you if using the kind of recognizable and thus neutered modes of subversion um, as she does, doesn't, uh, in fact, allow us not to think difference, but instead to access the very power structures by which she is um, trying to escape being repressed. She brings up, I think, in her work, um, many points about the repressive structures, but also if one, and this is my big question for, for you and for Emin, um, if we think about Emin as a feminist since she says she is one, and we don't like her very much, how do we think about our own position in terms of feminism? And again, every, there may be many people here who love her, um, but I know that there's a way in which there are um, the kind of self-proclamations around feminism that may, in fact, make a kind of ambivalence within an audience, and that's a question for you. With Anna's paper, I, I really responded quite a lot to this idea of the parasitical, and I thought it was quite interesting. I'm almost done. I know that we have to um, hurry it along. The parasitical in relationship to patriarchy, but I kind of wondered along those lines if the parasitical um, is already patriarchal. So if we could talk about um, that a little bit. Why must this, I think, quite, kind of interestingly queer model that you put forward rely on heterosexual operations and a kind of romantic rejection um, in the way that it does? Isn't there more in your case studies than just a rejection of the white heterosexual man, um, but more of a kind of rejection of the system, which I think you're pointing mm -hmm. to? Yeah. Um, even Rizontamont, in terms of kind of a Nietzschean um, 
philosophy has a certain heterosexuality to it as well. Here you point, interestingly, I think, to self-abasement and Wendy Brown's idea of the wounded attachment. Again, all of these kind of um, uh, issues of loss and, and sort of sadness and ripping open. Um, and you ask, how do feminists recover and get a place um, of one's own? And here again, I would point back to Uruguay in a certain way. Virginia Woolf. And Virginia Woolf. Here, um, I would ask about the fantasy of liberation that you're um, pointing us towards, but wondering if it's so liberatory after all. My question would be, if we agree that there must be some logic of feminism um, to uh, other elements and objects, et cetera, is this the only relationship that can be imagined, even if it is reimagined as you do? In other words, the parasitical, even when you turn it um, so precisely, and, and again, I really I like it, but I think even if you push the parasitical to the extreme um, and the parasite overcomes its host, the host mm -hmm. dies. So mm -hmm. I was curious about um, something that I'm interested in myself, getting further inside the system while, this is gonna sound super new agey, but he, like healing it. So um, a notion of homeopathy, for right, instance. Because the, the wound has to stay intact for that, yeah. Yeah, so I'm just curious if you could talk about um, a po like a, I'm gonna say words like positive now, and I don't, I don't quite mean that. Um, moving on to Zeta, um, this question of writing as um, ostensibly disembodied, I think is very important. Um, you suggest that there's a way to perhaps re-embody, or perhaps even more interestingly, suggest that writing's always embodied, and of course this has been a purview of feminist theory for a very long time, the, the idea that writing is itself an embodied practice. I think it's particularly interesting in terms of an intersection between, um, between race and uh, feminism, because there's a sort of double uh, indemnity at, at stake in, in this question. Your focus on the fear underlying your considerations of representation are interesting. When I first read the paper, I wasn't sure where you were going. Um, with it, I thought it was sort of an interesting um, confession. Um, but in fact, the anxiety around visibility that you confess to also seems to be a kind of methodology, that there's a way in which you're saying that a kind of historicity around representation informs your current looking, which is interesting. And again, to go back to someone like Sidia Hartman, who refuses to show images um, for fear that it will repeat. Um, it will not remind people, it will simply repeat the, the violence instead of asking for an analysis. But this anxiety is not only, I, th I would ask you to respond to this, the anxiety is not only a space of fear, but also an awareness of history and a place where pedagogical and discursive um, stakes get played out, as you yourself seem aware. Audre Lorde's Your Silence Will Not Protect You is particularly resonant in terms of your withholding um, the Bartman image, but she also goes on to say in another context, and I think this is interesting, that silence is lying. It isn't just withholding. It's actually a form of lying. And in particular, in terms of feminists, she says um, that it's a way of withholding um, a kind of um, a kinship or alliance, which I find interesting in this regard. And I wondered if you could talk about your um, anxiety about your students' mixed reactions to McLean Thomas's work. It seemed to me that that's what exactly you would want, in a sense, rather than having them all um, be such good students that they came up with exactly um, the same reaction to images that are themselves asking to be problematized in the way that you ultimately do. So I guess my big question for you would be, how do you maintain uh, an anxious pedagogy and still have a little bit of pleasure, um, too? So those are my questions for you guys. And I know we're past time, but we started a bit late and things ran over. So I'm just gonna hope that folks from the audience and folks on the panel will wanna have a brief conversation, if that's helpful. So thank you all for having me and listening to me too. Does anyone on, on the panel wanna start? Looks like you do, Claire. Um, those are really great, provocative questions. Can you guys hear me? I can't tell if this is on. Okay. Um, the question of invisibility is one that is coming back to me, and it's clearly something that's been in the history of art since, I don't know, since at least the 
beginning of the 20th century, and um, in some cases it has, in the most sort of memorable and historically significant cases, Duchamp and Rodchenko, it has, it, it eventuates their withdrawal from the art world and from the practice of creating objects. And um, I'm kind of at this place now actually in my thinking where I, I'm, not, I'm not seeing a through line, as you put it in the beginning. I'm not seeing a way out necessarily. Um, and that goes for feminism and it goes for the pr production of objects in general. And um, I think that's why I found this particular piece by Ackerman so compelling. And um, I'm hoping that I find a way out at some point. Um, but I think that it is a really interesting thread that ran through most of these presentations and through a lot of um, the scholarship that um, is happening right now, this sense of anxiety around representation. And um, I, I'm not sure. I, I'm not sure where we'll be in ten years. If we'll we'll still be thinking about that question, or or where it will take us. Um, in terms of this piece, you you mentioned um, the condition of invisibility as it functions in art spectatorship, and um, what uh, what I found interesting about this piece is is the the trope of invisibility doesn't come through unless you spend three hours thinking about the piece because the, the 90 minute projection is so long and um, it takes a lot of time to, to, to appreciate it. Um, and so if you, if you allow for that time, you get to this place where not only is surveillance being resisted, but also the kind of um, spectatorial gratification of art spectatorship is being resisted also because if we're, we're, we're there to see the protagonist, that protagonist is withdrawn from our vision and we're frustrated. And so that's kind of an interesting um, example of a kind of Rodchenko-esque withdrawal on Ackerman's part and not, not willing to take it to the next level, but obviously grappling with that question. Um, I know you brought up so many interesting points. I'm not, maybe I should let someone else uh, pitch in a few sure. comments. I have like a hundred things I want to say. <laughs> um, maybe I won't say a hundred, but um, I want to hit a couple of things, I think. And then you guys just maybe jump in and we'll have a conversation because I don't want to say too much. Um, okay. Okay. So you asked this question about why go to the white heterosexual example, right? Like why, why privilege that in, in giving it, you know, 20 minutes? And I think that um, maybe the heterosexual romance, um, um, is sort of like Gabrielle's zebra dress, you know, in the sense that, like, um, in the sense that um, you, I, I, I can't, I can't think about like dictating any kind of moralistic, like, I can't think about saying that there shouldn't be X, Y, Z. Like, I can only think about saying maybe it can't be the only thing you have in your closet. It has to be something among other things that are given space and time. Um, and I think that maybe this also gets to the negativity, that the question of the negativity, um, because really what I was trying to get at is, and I think that this is what's so seductive about this figure of the parasite for me, and maybe for you, um, is the way in which the parasite um, uh, shores up the, the sort of symbiosis and the possibility of thinking an ecosystem. And I think it can be, um, I think it's difficult to think about an ecosystem that is a kind of hetero ecosystem, right? Where it's kind of two, kind of based on difference, um, but really que queering the idea of, of a kind of symbiosis or a kind of um, um, uh, the, the way that we maybe have to start to think about the way that we can't escape completely, like I was talking about, um, the, the, you know, Googling utopia is interesting because it's like this, def you know, deferral of, of, um, of a kind of escape that, um, that is a kind of liberatory escape that might, might be possible. But um, um, so I'm, I'm interested in, you know, the way in which we maybe can start to think about not a, a getting outside of the system, but rather a, a seeing the system as, um, sort of complexly intertwined, um, where there's not just negativity, but there's negativity um, really, um, really intertwined with positivity, intertwined with, and I don't, also I don't want to think about it in terms of um, the sort of um, 
the binary, the, the kind of logocentric binary you never get out of, but the way that these things feed each other, and it's not just like women's loss, women's loss, women's loss, but men's loss, people's loss, trans loss, and I think this also gets to the fragmentation thing, which is, I think, maybe it's a really beautiful thing in the sense that what you think about the alternative to fragmentation would be what, a kind of, um, that would be the real anxiety, I would think, of the anxiety of trying to keep the thing that's whole, that's unified. Um, and, and it's also interesting to think the way that negativity literally is the possibility of negative space within a kind of whole that would break it apart. And maybe that gets us to the, refle the reflexive, reflective thing that you gave us and the way that we can begin to um, think about a kind of model that, that where pieces can reflect off of each other rather than just being um, you know, this or this or this heterosexual, you know, straight, you know, white, you know, black, you know, what, what have you. So um, I hope that that maybe gets to a couple of your questions. Um, those were a couple of thoughts I had. That's great. We have, um, we're going to open it up to you guys in just a minute. I just wanted to hear from both Patricia and, and Zeta if you guys want to jump in. Sure. Um, in, well, in response to um, perhaps two of your questions, um, if we think Emin is a feminist and we don't like her, what does that mean? <laughs> um, and she is quite a polarizing figure in the art world, and I think all the more power to her for that matter, because what that does is it creates discourse and it fosters a sense of tolerance for feminists that aren't, I guess, traditional, and I don't want to use that word, but I'm going to, for lack of a better term. Um, what that will do is it will cause, you know, all types of feminists, and I think in the third wave um, collective term, we're now seeing that there is a lot more focus on um, alternative feminisms. It's not white middle class anymore like it um, predominantly was back um, in second wave times. So I think that's a positive contribution that her personality and her art makes to society on the whole. Um, and if you could connect that to um, practical sort of um, modes and such, we enjoy discussing on a theoretical level art, and that's what we're here to do today. But what this ultimately should lead to is our activity outside of the lecture hall and um, the museum. So what I think an artist like Emin can do by creating controversy and sort of um, creating discomfort amongst feminism is to really mobilize feminists to think about re-approaching old ideas and old techniques and maybe working to figure out how we can invigorate um, what we've come to, you know, to term as, uh, you know, feminism in today's climate. Okay, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, well, I have anxiety issues, so I write about my anxiety pretty often. Um, but, you know, it's interesting that I don't, I don't think my students read it as anxiety, and that is one of the things that worries me, uh, because I teach a course on gender, terror, and trauma in African American culture, and we focus for an entire semester on representations of lynching um, and other forms of racial violence, um, that there, there does become a way in which, um, particularly because my students are mostly white, um, and most don't identify as feminist, um, that they come to understand black feminist cultural criticism as a way of insisting upon the victimization of black people, which is important. Um, but I think I wanna make sure that I, I teach the way that I was trained, which is that you lead with what you like. And I want them to make sure that they can um, not be ashamed of the fact that they find pleasure in Beyonce because frankly I work with elementary school and teenage girls and if I say to them you know who do you think of as a feminist they say Beyonce right she's an independent strong assertive woman etc cetera, etc cetera. Um, so when I come in and critique her it actually defeats <laughs> my intent of, of kind of opening up feminism feminisms to a whole bunch of younger people um, but I had students just last week, or, or last month rather, after we watched a film on, um, I think it was called The Souls of Black Girls, and they said, well, you know, what if I want to go to the club and shake my, you know, what if I want to do that? And, uh, you know, are you telling me I can't do that? And I said, no, I'm not telling you you can't do that. You can do, the point of feminism is that you can do what you want to do with your own body, but it would be irresponsible for me as an educator not to say that there are risks out there. So it really is, the anxiety is about finding that balance. Yeah. It's about opening things up and not shutting things down completely in any kind of way, um, but possibly instilling a kind of anxiety in them yeah. 
not hypervigilance. Yeah. I'm not trying to traumatize them, <laughs> but, um, and some of them were deeply traumatized by the lynching course, which was right. interesting at a women's college that I had to take so many other precautions when teaching the course, but um, ultimately the goal is um, not to deny pleasure. Right, or anxiety. Or anxiety, exactly. They're, they, they're deeply well. Yes, together. everything's allowed. <laughs> Would anyone out there like to ask a question of the panelists? Ange Swartz. What do you, yes. and gender play. <laughs> say it loud. <laughs> I actually, I missed the last part of your question. So what would I say about her lesbianism? What do you think about her lesbianism and her gender play? And yes. how it operates in her work? Especially the recent. Especially the, the, the recent, recent work. work. The recent work, okay. Um, well, I, M Micheline and I, Micheline Thomas and I were trying to connect so that I could interview her, and I sent her a long list of questions, and one of the questions was around um, sexual orientation, and then I removed it because I wasn't sure that it was appropriate for me to broach the topic, and I thought, well, if I do go to her studio and we start having a conversation and it becomes clear what my in intentions are, perhaps then I can bring it up. Um, but I do find it fascinating that she... Um, she, in a sense, she, by centering the women, she doesn't even just marginalize men from her art, she excludes them altogether. And, and so it, it isn't appropriate or even accurate to assume that every consumer of her art is male identified, which is something I found that I was doing. Um, and I had been teaching Laura Mulvey a couple of weeks ago in my film class and that idea of objectification and to be looked at-ness, and isn't there a way of of negotiating your consumption of an image. And I thought about Jacqueline Bobo and what she said about black women as a group being able to extract meaning from mainstream texts, even when those texts aren't meant to serve them or to please them. Um, and so I think that Micheline presents us with beauty and appeal and sexuality that is really quite open there aren't any limits on it. And because she isn't explicitly saying, like the, the way that I looked at the picture and thought, that's for me, um, that speaks to a kind of openness in terms of construction so that you don't, it was inaccurate or unfair for me, I think, to posit her images as being the same as what we see on BET or what we saw in the black exploitation films, which again, I assumed were for the pleasure of men, but they aren't only or exclusively. And I think she really, um, empowers all kinds of consumers by, by making it as open as she does and figuring herself as a, as a desiring woman as in the Afro goddess image as well. Um, my question is about uh, the relationship between autobiography and feminism. Um, you know, of course, many of the uh, artists that we heard about in this panel um, either use autobiography or at least an autobiographical, an autobiographic persona in their work. And I think that actually, I think that distinction is important. Um, so I guess autobiography and art informed by feminism, but then also autobiography and feminist discourse, because um, something that I've also I've noticed throughout the day is that um, many of the uh, panelists, presenters, um, have used uh, pers you know, have drawn on personal experiences or anecdotes in framing their um, discussions, which I, th I think is interesting, um, just as a rhetorical strategy. And I'm wondering, I don't know, does anyone have thoughts? Does that have something to do specifically with the um, topic that we're all here to think about? Okay, I'll I'll jump in. Um, well, in in my particular paper. Um, uh, I think I'd go to performance as a way to sort of um, deal with um, the um, reading, uh, the sort of pitfalls of reading um, autobiography as authentic. And um, yeah, I definitely, and I'd love to hear what you have to say, Patricia, just in terms of the relationship between the autobiographical and the autoerotic and um, in the way, and maybe I'll maybe I'll make this about you and, and maybe I, if I can add to your question maybe I don't want to 
change your question, but I would add the way that um, maybe um, maybe there's something to be asked about um, pleasure and autobiography and um, and the way that masturbation um, kind of uh, complicates all of these um, all of these questions that we're already asking when we're trying to talk about self pleasure and um, and performing self pleasure and how that um, maybe changes things um, and also maybe the way that mas you know masturbation isn't whether you can kind of queer that through performance. I don't know. Do you have thoughts? Um, I do. Maybe not necessarily about masturbation anymore, but um, <laughs> certainly autobi autobiography and confessionalism. Um, I'm first and foremost a literature scholar, so I work in modes of poetry. Um, confessional poetry, which is a pro problematic term personally, but I think one that is helpful. Um, when you read these sort of, you know, Sylvia Plath, Anne Sexton, Robert Lowell type poems with the eye, it's very seductive, right? It sucks you in because it's, it's, it's a very personal mode of discourse. It feels like you're being directly addressed, um, like you're part of the work. And I feel that with feminism in particular, with female artists, there is that sort of level and mode of identification that occurs, mm -hmm. I think, um, especially if you're searching for different ways to express yourself or different ways to assert um, complicated identities. It's really, um, I feel liberating in a way to be confronted with this type of art and to sort of understand that um, there is space for you out there and there is space for you to sort of Indulge yourself, right? We're often told that um, the, the too, too much information, keep it to yourself. <laughs> um, and I think that it's actually liberating, powerful to understand that using the I and being personal, um, confessing transgressions can be a political act, I think. But it's also interesting how that gets racialized, right? Like in your paper, the way that white women seem to be moving in a direction of like exposure, exposure, <clears throat> exposure in sort of performance practices. And then the way that you are kind of posing, I think certain questions about, um, so anxieties about that. I think you were talking about um, with Gabrielle again, um, you were worried because there was so much exposure. Mm -hmm. Well, there's a way in which if it, as Joanna was saying, if it's not self-reflexive, then it's simply narcissistic. And we really, that doesn't help anybody. Um, and when you belong to a dominant group and you're dominating space, taking up I, 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 talking about your experience, I think it's necessary to also reflect and say, who am I excluding by running my mouth so much? You know, whose voice is not being heard? Mm. Yeah. Do we have time for one last question? <laughs> Going back to the uh, Sarah Bartman issue, a friend of mine does a lot of work on Sarah Bartman and one of the thing she did is went back and asked some Khoisan people what the historical understanding of Sarah Bartman was and actually went to a professor who's Khoisan, which is the group that Sarah Bartman comes to mm -hmm. and sort of wrote the first dissertation on Sarah Bartman from the Khoisan perspective. Wow, that's good. And from the Khoisan perspective, one of the things that they found is um, this same friend, who's actually my wife, wrote um, <laughs> She wrote an essay on Susan Lloyd Park's understanding of Sarah Bartman. And one of the things, having studied the Khoisan understanding, one of the things that she came to find is that a lot of the African-American perception of Sarah Bartman reinscribed the same Western racism that was already there. In other words, mm -hmm. things like her being a prostitute were not real at all. Things like her having signed a contract to go do this work in London was not real at all. Mm -hmm. Things like her having the extended labia were not real at all because that particular group doesn't practice any of these things. So the thing that was interesting in hearing the discussion is that you had mentioned Sir Bartman, but when it came back to the discussion of bodies, it came to African-American women and kind of skipped all the other women of color who sort of no matter what, kind of are left with whatever happens under the table 
after these presentations in America. In other words, it's very easy to present a leopard skin as an or, or a zebra skin as an intellectual here who can then jump off the table and go back into being a professor, etc. But there's another woman who's bearing the brunt of that gaze somewhere else without a PhD, without an education, and it's still being, that's reinscribing that for her in what's quote called the third world. And I just want you to speak to if that complexity is something um, that you're thinking about. Because I fully understand your need to be very selective about that exposure, partially because we're, re we're referring to things that we haven't even studied completely yet. We're looking at Sarah Bartman but we haven't even come to a complete understanding of what that episode was, or even gone back as black people to the black people who went through that experience and asked them what it meant to them. Yeah, well I think there are different projects. I don't think Susan Laurie Parks was trying to represent historical truth. I think she was actually toying with and complicating that idea. That there is no way really to go back and ascertain absolutely for certain what happens because we would have to have had Sarah Barton speaking in her own voice. And I would just say that having a PhD doesn't protect me from anything. Um, <laughs> it is certainly a privilege and I, I have access to certain spaces, but I mean, we could have a whole panel on what it's like to be a black woman in the academy. There was just a conference last month on what that's like. Um, so I don't purport to speak for um, all black women everywhere. Uh, and certainly diaspora is complicated. There are continuities, there are competing, conflicting experiences. Um, I was speaking to the ways in which, I, w I would agree with you in that Sarah Bartman has become um, a kind of symbol for African American feminists um, that sometimes is not complicated enough because she is symbolic and then she therefore loses some of her own um, specificity. But again, it's hard to access that. It's great that your wife went and talked to the Khoisan, but I'm not sure that even in her research, she would be able to know exactly what it was like for Sarah Bartman in the moment of her existence in the late 18th and early 19th century. Um, so what I thought Susan Laurie Parks was trying to do, why I teach her play, um, is that she's complicating, first of all, she's presenting it as a fictional narrative. She's telling it, she's playing with time and linearity by telling it backwards. Um, and she makes the Venus into um, a figure that is not wholly likable or sympathetic. And that to me is extraordinarily daring because the ways in which Sarah Bartman has been used by many African American um, feminists or scholars or intellectuals is that she is figured as the ultimate victim. Um, and to say that it's possible that this woman, similar to Josephine Baker, had choices, um, demonstrated her own agency for, uh, for Susan Laurie Parks, potentially participated in her own exploitation. Those are really complicated ideas that ultimately, I think, assert the humanity of the person rather than this overriding objection or victimization. Um, so I don't purport to speak for all black women everywhere. I think you're right that the discourse around um, Sarah Bartman and the spectacularization of the black female body um, impacts different people in different ways. Um, but that's, that's, that's what it is, it is complicated. So thank you for pointing out that it is complicated, I agree. Maybe as one last um, expansion on this point, because I think it's interesting who's called upon, who to, um, in terms of representation, as though, I mean, this question brings up this, this question um, that I think has been kind of hovering um, throughout these papers and even earlier, that, that when you tell one story, um, there's an expectation for a kind of um, fidelity to a history. Mm -hmm. And every one of the papers here has problematized that and asked for certain um, attention to be paid to the kind of theoretical or speculative work that actually happens and think about it as a place where thinking happens. And I wondered if you could talk just for a second about Chantal Ackerman in this way, which is to say that um, she's precisely not trying to speak for the subjects that she's keeping sort of out of the frame, as it were. So could you just say what it is you think, um, you know, the kinds of misinterpretations of her work are kind of interesting in this respect as well, perhaps? Um, um, I'm just thinking of somebody who's, who's spent so many decades thinking about a kind of identificatory strategies, um, and this particular project that you talked about operates somewhat differently from some of the earlier ones, and I thought maybe you'd have 
something to say about that or anything yeah. else. I just want to, I want to get you to say one more thing. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to be transparent about it. I really want to hear one more time from Claire. Um, nothing is coming up uh, directly in terms of Chantal Ackerman's work or this piece in particular. I mean, I think it's, it's a, a withdrawal to represent um, a subject that interests her, but that is obviously extremely complicated for her. Um, and she's not willing to lapse into a kind of um, representational mode that, uh, that she has such um, questions about. So her strategy for dealing with that is to show a blank screen. And um, I don't know where that takes us, right, but right. Um, it's, it's something that, that she's left us with. And Maybe it's pre-feminism. <laughs> yeah, maybe. I, interestingly, her, the, the work that she made um, most recently since this project is uh, it's called Seven Women in Antwerp, I think, and it's a gigantic screen, so sensual, beautiful, incredible, um, close-up uh, portrait of these seven women standing on the street corner in various, um, in various ways and various modes of experience, daily experience, and um, there's no dialogue or anything. And it's, it's sort of the inverse of um, this project in that it, it fills the screen with a, a sensual display of women. Um, and I'm not sure what, what her steps were mm -hmm. uh, between the two projects, but it's interesting. So I guess with that, we should close. Thank you all so much. Thank you, panelists. Thank you. I also just wanted to thank everyone who presented today and to all of you who came. Um, the museum remains open until 6 o'clock, so please, um, it doesn't give you a lot of time, but please stay and enjoy the rest of the day. Thanks.